everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Hello and welcome to the Everyday Injustice Podcast. I'm your host, David Greenwald. For the past 10 years, we have operated Vanguard Court Watches in California, including San Francisco, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. Our goal? Expose everyday court injustices, and now, more broadly, shine a spotlight on injustices in the entire criminal justice system in the form of wrongful convictions, police and prosecutorial misconduct, and mass incarceration. This podcast hopes to take it a step further and highlight criminal justice reform on a national level. Every day in justice. Today on Every Day in Justice, we have Danielle Harris from the Public Defender's Office in San Francisco. How are you doing? I'm good, David. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. So tell us what the Freedom Project is. Absolutely. The Freedom Project is our uh, the post-conviction relief arm of the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. We're, we're one of the newest units in the office, and we realized there was a huge need for post-conviction representation because of changes in law that have happened over the last five years six years now, uh, which give people pathways to come back to the trial court after they've served long sentences, but they're still serving those sentences to to get a second look, essentially. And how big a team do you have? We have grown to a team of eight, which is wonderful. There's three staff attorneys, two legal assistants, and we have three reentry and mitigation specialists. So we really do holistic wraparound representation. We've also been able to expand to represent folks in parole hearings when resentencing opportunities don't, don't pan out. I think we're the first public defender's office in California to be handling uh, parole representation, which is very exciting. And I hope, I hope others will, will be able to follow. And, and several of uh, your staff are actually themselves formerly incarcerated. We have one one of our legal assistants is formerly incarcerated, and um, what a wealth of information he is. He and I actually founded the project together back in late 2019, and I didn't know very much. I was a public defender. I've been a public defender since 1999, but I didn't do post-conviction work until 2019. And so the learning curve for me was steep. And um, Steph Lieb, who's, who's our legal assistant, without his knowledge gained, you know, firsthand, unfortunately, it would have been a very different trajectory. But with that knowledge, we were able to to get up to speed really uh, pretty quickly and get right in there to try to help folks out. And we honored Steph Lieb last year. So apparently it's a tradition to be honoring uh, the work of the Freedom Project. Yeah, thank you for honoring Steph. He is, he is uh, highly deserving. On the one hand, you know, it seems like this is unique. On the other hand, it seems like more public defenders offices should be doing post-conviction work. Absolutely. There are, don't get me wrong now, many public defenders office doing post-conviction work generally, and that is largely um, because these cases, some of these cases are coming back into the trial court. And when trial court representation is needed, you know, the first line is is the public defender's office. Unfortunately, with new laws, frequently implementation is not thought out super well, much less funded. Um, and so public defenders who are already under-resourced are absorbing new work without 
a lot of funding. The state did pitch in some temporary funding, which is wonderful. And counties are really going to have to try to pick that up when that when that funding runs out. Um, but what we found in terms of the parole hearing side of things, we were getting to know folks really well in making resentencing application uh, or petitions for them. And if that wasn't successful, that person had a parole hearing coming up and it made perfect sense that we would continue our representation through the parole hearing. But um, that requires resources and we're lucky to to be able to offer that to some folks we can't still can't we don't have the resources to offer it to everybody um, but as far as i know um we may still be the only public defender's office who's providing parole hearing representation which is really unfortunate and has most of the um, resentencing work been either under 1437 or 1170D? So those are two of the bigger buckets. Another one is, was SB 483, which eliminated one-year prison priors and thus meant all that all those cases that included one-year prison priors had to come back for resentencing and we're still working through those. Those are um, the main avenues. There are also avenues for um, kids who were sentenced as adults to very long terms. And so we've been we've been helping get some cases back to juvenile court where they belong after decades, believe it or not. So can you um recall like a success story or give an example of somebody that you've worked with recently? Uh, yes, I can recall um, many. We've uh, we've been able to reunite 80 families uh, since 2020. So it has been um, very, very successful. And I could give you examples um, in all categories, really, we just had a guy come home who was 16 when he was uh, tr tried as an adult. He served over 30 years, and this was a non-homicide case, not a sexual assault either, so not what we consider the most serious case types. Um, his case had quite an interesting trajectory, but we were able to get his sentence recalled after 30 years. Uh, he was then sent back to the juvenile court and released there to his transitional housing program. Um, and, and that's just one, one of many, many wonderful examples. Are you finding with the new DA's office that you're having to fight these things out in court more? <clears throat> yes, we, a lot of our early successes were through district attorney initiated resentencing. And that really ended when um, we had a change in administration last summer. When Brooke Jenkins was appointed district attorney, there, her office did not recommend a single person for prosecutor-initiated resentencing for 13 months. We've now had two recommendations. It's They've been... Uh, Jenkins has been in office now, I think, 14 or 15 months, and we've had two people referred to the court for resentencing. Um, so that is that is definitely disappointing and is a huge, huge change from the previous district attorney. So she's even making my DA look good. Yeah. Um, you know, Progressive San Francisco uh, has a very, very old school prosecutor's office right now. Some of some of it is, you know, we're hearkening back to the 1990s. Um, and these second look laws are designed 
to give folks who were sentenced in the 80s, 90s, when our thinking about a lot of things was different and less informed by scientific progress and, and social science. And on the other hand, we're, we're regressing to some of those old, old ways of thinking. So what mechanisms exist now if the DA's office is not initiating the resentencing uh, for, for you guys to get uh, hearings and resentencing now? There's limited options. The You mentioned SB 37, the law around murder and attempted murder in certain instances changed a few years ago. And so a uh, certain group of folks who are convicted of murder, manslaughter, or attempted murder have a path for possible resentencing. People who were um, convicted of an offense and given additional time for prior terms, whether one year prison priors or three year drug priors, they have a path now to be uh, considered again for sentencing as the legislature eliminated those, those laws allowing for those additional terms. There's, um, as I mentioned, for minors who were treated as an adult and given very long sentences, you know, it took until about 2005 for the United States Supreme Court to recognize that kids are different and that they can't be given life without parole sentences and they can't now be given either um, or, or they can't be given those sentences automatically, I should say, that there needs to be individualized consideration. And now our California courts have said that a life term may be the equivalent of life without parole, even if it's not technically called that. So those um, former kids who were put into prison as teenagers have a path uh, for resentencing, which has been really, really uh, heartening. Um, and then there's the parole board, as I mentioned, for people serving life terms have opportunity to go in front of the parole board every so many years. It varies from case to case how often they'll go. And so that that is a potential path home as well so it, it, it seems like you know a lot of people you know think oh well you're you're letting criminals out but you know we know so much more now than we did maybe 30 years ago in terms of two really key things right on the one hand um you know brain development and the fact that the kids uh act much more impulsively they're much more violent and the brain is really not fully developed until they're 25. And then on the other end it is kind of this aging out process, which is probably part and parcel to the same phenomenon. But basically, you know, at a certain age, people just stop committing crimes. Yeah, we know that no matter when someone goes into prison, they're likely going to age out of crime at, at some point. Um, you know, recidivism dramatically decreases starting at age 40 and then every every time after that until age 60 there's almost zero recidivism and you wouldn't think we would have a lot of people uh, uh, older than age 60 in prison but we we do we have many many people um we also know in terms of kids is that most kids who commit crimes age out, the vast majority of them will not continue uh, committing crimes in their adulthood. And we also know that it's really impossible to tell who that rare kid is who will continue. It's, it's um, guesswork at best. We also have a system which, uh, you know, at least gives lip service to rehabilitation. Our, our prison system is the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And if we believe that people can change and grow and rehabilitate, if we believe in redemption, 
then we have to provide opportunities for people to show to show that they have in fact uh, changed. And we, one of the most gratifying things about this work has been that we're generally not challenging guilt. We're generally working with people who have a deep, deep acceptance of responsibility and remorse and are able to have done incredible um, self-exploration and far more than than the vast majority of people in the free world do and and really really can give us a lot of hope that the problems that some of the problems that we face are can be remedied can be um, solved in in um, when we provide programs, provide tools, um, redemption is real, and and for those of us who believe in it, it it's um, it's a powerful thing to see. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Some of the stories people who you know go into prison often at a young age, they've been abused, they've grown up in broken homes. They've grown up in extreme poverty. Um, most of them, you know, don't finish high school. Uh, some may not even start high school. Um, and then they go into the prison system and we're finally starting to understand that, hey, you know, if we actually give them opportunities for education, that's a way to improve public safety. And, uh, you know, it seems like a no brainer and yet, for years, it seems like we've gone the other way. Um, oh, you know, we're punishing these people. We don't want to educate them. Right. Well, if people are going to be coming back into society and the vast majority of folks who go to prison are going to come back, we, we should work really hard to help them come back in a far better place than they left and if we focused more resources on that and less on punishment, we would probably have a safer, safer world. There is good research that programming is a protective factor in terms of recidivism. Um, and we could we can do a lot more than than what we're doing currently. The, the most of my clients are who are still in prison are on multiple wait lists for programs. There, there just definitely are not enough programs for the people who who want them. Kind of walk through um, how this process works. How do you? Uh, at what point did you guys get in contact with people? And then how does how does it work as as you go through the process? We connect with people through various ways. People reach out to us directly. Families reach out. Um, colleagues reach out about old clients that they had. And then we do some targeted outreach. We've tried to identify uh, cohorts of people who are serving prison sentences from San Francisco because we're only working with people who are sentenced out of San Francisco. Who, who we think that might have a pathway back. And we've, we've written, written to folks and, and offered to review their cases to see whether we could in fact help them. So we've done probably six or seven outreach cohorts thus far and are gonna, preparing to do another, another one soon. And then how's the process work, like through the courts? It depends. It depends, as I've said, what what a person might be eligible for. You know, the, the dream is that one day there will be a way for anyone to request a second look after a certain period of time. Unfortunately, that's not the case right now. So when I get a case, I'm first going to review it to see whether there's a realistic chance that we could we could try to help somebody. Um, of course, there's never a guarantee, but if I can't even see a pathway to work towards 
then I'm going to unfortunately tell the person that we're not able to help them right now. But if we identify a path, then the first um, months, depending on how long the record collection process takes, is is really just building out our file to get a hold of all the information that we need to look at. That means getting the prison file, which often takes a, a strangely long time, medical records when there may be uh, medical issues involved, psychological records, if there's mental health or cognitive records, we're often trying to reconstruct a person's uh, social history, their childhood, all the way back to birth. I'm working with a man right now who's uh, 59 years old, and he was is now for the first time diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome, but he was never properly diagnosed and thus never properly treated. So we are often getting new and independent evaluations done um, in order to properly present a case. And then once we have everything we need, we have all the records, we've been able to develop a social history to do whatever evaluations that need to be done. Then if we have a pathway into court, we're filing a petition in the court. If we don't have a pathway in court, we are preparing uh, in all likelihood for the parole board or we're putting in an application to the district attorney's office and asking them to consider the person for, for prosecutor initiated resentencing. And as you mentioned, uh, the current DA's office hasn't been very receptive to that. Mm -hmm. How receptive have the judges been? So the law has evolved over even this short period of time on in that area for prosecutor initiated resentencing. So at this point, given the strengthened state of the law, the judges have been actually um, quite receptive. But that's that's largely because the law says the law is just quite favorable that once you have a pathway into court, the bar is pretty high for a judge to reject reject a resentencing. And, um, you know, we've watched quite a few 1437 cases out of San Francisco. Are you still getting those now? Few, definitely fewer and further between. Um, so most of them are under either the youthful offender or 1170D? Most of the resentencing we're doing is the um, youthful for youth who were charged as adults. 1170D, I think you mean prosecutor initiated resentencing, which the right. section has changed. It's now 1172.1. Ah. And then... Can't keep up with it. <laughs> it's... it's challenging. They've changed the sections several times, but I think they're done now. And then the one year prior cases, as I said, there are tens of thousands of those across the state. Um, we're close to finished with them in San Francisco, and that's 1172.75. Those are the main resentencing petitions that we're, we're in court on at the moment. So is most of the work of the Freedom Project focused on resentencing or are there other avenues as well? It's probably half resentencing and half parole hearing representation at this point, approximately. We would prefer to be doing more resentencing, but as we've worked through the cases that are eligible for us to get to to self petition rather than try to convince somebody else to petition we have fewer cases that that where um there is a resentencing path but we are always looking for a resentencing path first because we can then actually file the petition and and try to 
try to move the case through the courts. That's our preference. Now, I know the public defender's office often advocates for legislation. Does the Freedom Project do that as well? We do. We do. We've been involved in several legislative efforts uh, this year, last year, since we began. We we were uh, we sponsored our office. The public defender's office sponsored AB fifteen forty, which strengthened the prosecutor initiated resentencing law made it so that there was a presumption that once the DA had made the recommendation that the court should grant it and and provided other procedural protections. There is another bill this year that's waiting uh, the governor's signature, AB 600. We consulted on that bill and that gives judges the ability to recall a case for sentencing no matter how old it is. Currently, a judge can't do it unless a DA or CDCR or the Board of Parole Hearings makes the recommendation. If AB 600 is enacted, judges, in theory, will be able to recall sentences on their own. And so that means that if a judge felt that their hands were tied because of the law required a certain sentence, but they didn't believe that it was a just sentence and they would have done something different if the law allowed them to, they now have uh, the possibility of calling that sentence back and looking to see whether current law gives more discretion. So I don't know how often that is going to be utilized, but for the you know few situations where it is utilized, we'll see uh, hopefully some some more injustice corrected. So would that require the same judge to revisit the sentence, or not necessarily? Because of course judges may move on into different work into retirement or uh, pass on. And so it's not it's not limited to those people whose trial judge is still available. Any judge can recall any case from that county. Now the the individual counties may designate that only a certain judge maybe deals with that provision. I'm not sure. We'll, we're, we'll all find out together. Um, and would like your office be able to petition the judge to do that, or would it have to be the judge's own initiative? We can't petition per se. We could make a request or an invitation, and but the judge doesn't have to hear our request or schedule a hearing on it. It is, it is the judge themselves wouldn't have to proactively like search for these cases. It could not get necessarily in front if, of them at least. We can certainly try. If they will let us, we will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of course, you know, we're gonna use it sparingly, but in in those cases that that really cry out for for correction. Um and then I guess one last question for you. Think about maybe the poster child case for the Freedom Project. And can you describe that? We had a um, gathering in my office yesterday and there was a young man who, who just came home about a month ago who agreed to come to our office training and we were really just trying to educate you know we have an office of over 200 and trying to educate in the everyone in just in our office even about what it is that we offer and how we can help them when they have clients who are heading to prison unfortunately or whatnot um, and so this young man agreed to join us and talk to the group which consists of lawyers investigators social workers, paralegals, um, all, all sorts. Um, and he was someone who was sentenced to a long-term 
as a young person, he was sentenced to 16 years for a very violent offense. And at some, he talked about his journey in prison and as a young black man, seeing that everybody in the um, prison seemed to look a lot like him more so than in the much more so than in the um, free world and how he was able to search inside himself and decide that he wanted really wanted to have a different life. Um, he did so incredibly well in prison that they removed the prison system removed his violent um designation essentially and he was able then to go to fire camp and train as a firefighter and we were able to bring him home late this summer and he talked about the ripple effects of harm and how he was able to to see how he had harmed not only his direct victim but the victim's family and the victim's co-workers who now had to adjust their lives in order to cover for this person and the long-term effects of, of um, surviving crime. We often think like it's just the initial harm that is at issue. He also talked about considering his own mother a victim. His mother ended up losing her job in sort of a chain of events after his arrest and and so just he was he's just an incredible example of the the deep reflection and um and good that can come when someone is given the chance to to um do do the work and when the system then also recognizes that they have done done that work it's an amazing story of what you guys have really been able to accomplish as an author i'm always in court in san francisco and it it's just fun to watch because your office is always challenging everything and you don't see that in a lot of other places and i i you know i think it makes a difference for your clients and to I then agree. be able to help on the back end and, and say look you know we're not just fighting you know uh one fight on uh on one end we're, we're fighting on both ends here I, I would say that public defenders are uniquely situated not just to litigate and fight for people in court, but to help people heal and grow and change. And a big part of that is that we have the attorney-client privilege that allows us to develop a level of trust and and through that trust, really get dig deep and get to the bottom of what folks need to heal. But what our criminal legal system is just a swirling cycle of harm, one on top of the other, and it continues with every jail booking, every prison commitment, it ripples out to families and communities across generations. And we know this. And until we begin to be realistic about ending those cycles of harm, our system continues, continues to be the, the unsatisfying <laughs> situation that it is from everybody's perspective. I don't think there's anybody in our system who thinks that it's, it's working great. And so, uh, I, I think that the more we involve public defenders in in disrupting those harm cycles the the better off we're all going to be well in three weeks we're going to be honoring danielle harris and the freedom project uh for their amazing work um thanks for sharing some of uh your experience uh with us today 
Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to to more discussion and and celebrating my team. It really is a team endeavor and and I'll I'll accept the award on behalf of the whole team at the Freedom Project. Thank you again. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mouse Quake Barrett for the use of our opening Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com. That's justiceforgeorgepowell, all one word, dot com.